This show is intended for general purposes only as individual situations may vary. Statements made should not be relied upon as recommendations or solicitation. When discussed, past performance is no guarantee or indication of future results. Nelson Financial Planning offers security through Nelson Ives Brokerage Services, member FINRA and SIPC. Good Sunday morning. This is Bud Hedinger. Next on News Radio 93.1 WFLA, the longest running radio show in Central Florida, Dollars and Cents, with my good friend Joel Garris from Nelson Financial Planning. You can call him at the office this week at 407 629 6477 to schedule your free consultation to discuss your retirement plans, or you can talk to him right now at 407 916 5400. It become Thanksgiving this week. My goodness, I, I just can't believe that, right? I mean, I'm looking at the calendar and there it is, coming right up on Thursday. Um, wow. Good morning. Hopefully you're thinking a little bit about what you're going to be doing for Thanksgiving. Maybe if you're like Stephanie and I, we've you know, kind of put a little menu together, and uh, and we've assigned out tasks. Somebody's bringing that, somebody's bringing that, somebody's bringing that, so it doesn't all just kind of fall on us. Um, so, but yeah, thinking, of, thinking ahead, my goodness. Uh, welcome to the program, by the way. This is Dollars and Cents. Uh, my name is Joel Garris of Nelson Financial Planning. We are Central Florida's longest-running radio program, started back uh, in uh, the uh, mid-80s uh, by my father-in-law, Jack Nelson, continued today by me, yours truly, Joel Garris. On the program, we talk about anything and everything to do with your dollars helping you make sense out of all of those different decisions uh, that have something to do with that almighty dollar. So, on the program today, we thought we would talk a little bit about the latest news uh, from 401ks. Um, and there has been uh, some significant news uh, for folks that are contributing to 401ks. And uh, for that matter, IRAs as well. So uh, much to talk about on the 401k uh, front today. So we will be focusing predominantly on that, talking about contribution limits, talking about what uh, the latest data shows in 401ks, uh, and how best to help prepare for retirement using your 401k. Because after all, um, that's really kind of the option that most people have. Now, when I say 401k, uh, that also would include things like 403Bs or 457s. That clump of of accounts, 401Ks, 403Bs, 457s, effectively operate the same way and have the same contribution limits with the exception or the difference sort of between them is that uh, depending upon the type of employer you have, then you wind up having a different flavor, if you will. 401ks, mostly seen on the for-profit side of things. 403bs, typically seen uh, among school districts. 457s, typically seen with other government entities. But basically, they sort of function the same way, if you will. Deferred comps got a little bit of a different twist to it in terms of accessibility of the money without ever having to worry about a 10% penalty for early withdrawal. But that's that's the, the most significant distinction, if you will, between those three. But basically, they're all uh, conceptually the same because the money you put into them is your money as an employee. It's predominantly your money as an employee, if there's a match by the employer or something like that, then you would see money coming in from your employer. But at the end of the day, it is uh, an election that you make to participate in these types of plans. Some talk of automatic enrollment out there, some of the features that are out there 
uh, can automatically enroll you or to um, have your contributions increase on a regular basis. Bottom line, though, it's still your money and it is still your decision whether you contribute. And at the end of the day, you really want to be contributing uh, because this is not the era of pensions. That was your parents, probably even more your grandparents' generation, where your employer set up retirement plans that were going to fund you a check a month for the rest of your life. Those really have gone the way of the dinosaur, simply because the liability associated with them is much greater and the risk associated with them from an employer perspective, right? I mean, imagine if I'm an employer and I've got a guarantee that that all of my retirees are going to get what was promised to them in the form of a pension benefit. That 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 from a from a employer from a company point of view is a big giant unknown, right? Because it's unknown how long people are going to live for and the age on that the average age on that keeps increasing it's also unknown how well the investments are, are going to perform certainly you can uh, make a target and and use an allocation that that ultimately uh, would probably get you to that 7 or 8% assumption uh, that's what most pension plans sort of use today i know the state of florida uh, uses uses that as its assumption for its rate of return as well on its pension. So, so the, the but but okay, none of that is on is guaranteed. So that means that you have uh, potentially a much greater liability than you realize. And so companies are saying and have been saying over the course of the past uh, few decades is we just don't want to have to deal with that from a business perspective. That's a big giant unknown. And if in business you can eliminate as many big giant unknowns as you can. Uh, then obviously uh, that allows you to uh, operate your business much more effectively, much more efficiently. So anyway, that that's the transition uh, more to putting it in your court. Uh, and that, after all, is what uh, 401k, 403b, 457, that's what those types of accounts effectively do. So in those accounts, just like in an IRA, there is a maximum limit that you can put away every year. And if you're over 50, there's a there's a little extra bonus you can contribute as well. Well, for a few years now, uh, that maximum contribution limit was eighteen thousand five hundred dollars. Eighteen thousand five hundred dollars. If you were over 50, you could um, put in an extra six thousand dollars. All right. Now. These contribution limits are indexed to inflation, and inflation has been very low of late, so they really haven't changed at all over the course of the past few years. Well, guess what? For next year, 2019, that number goes up, and that number goes up from eighteen five all the way up to $19,000. You say, great, that's an increase of $500. That doesn't seem like much. Well, if you run the numbers on it and invest an extra $500 annually over the next 30 years, assuming just a 7% return, that actually turns into about 50000 of retirement savings. That becomes much more significant if you are consistent and are trying to always do that maximum amount and you take advantage of this bump up. The other thing you want to be aware of is if you're putting your money into your 401k or 403b or 457 and you've got it you know sort of sort of mapped out if you will or mapped out that you're going to put that money in over the course of the year know that if you're trying to hit the maximum the maximum did go up to that 19,000 number and so now you may want to adjust how much is going in in order to make sure that you are meeting that maximum amount. The extra amount that you can put in, if you are over 50, that extra $6,000, that part did not change. So if you're over 50, you can still do the six. That did not go up. But the 18.5 is now 19. 
So that means that you can put up to a total of $25,000 into your 401k during the course of 2019. That's a pretty good chunk of change to save, particularly for your retirement. We've got other stats and, uh, and suggestions on 401ks when we get back here on the program Dollars and Cents. This is Joel Garris of Nelson Financial Planning here on News Radio 93.1 WFLA. This is Bud Hedinger. You know, you can talk to Joel Garris of Nelson Financial Planning right now on Dollars and Cents about anything to do with your money by calling 407-916-5400. Give him a call. It's time to make sense of your dollars. Welcome back to the program, ladies and gentlemen. Dollars and Cents here on News Radio 93.1 WFLA. Also simulcasting over there on the AM dial at 540 AM. This is Joel Garris of Nelson Financial Planning. You're listening to Dollars and Cents. We were uh, giving you the latest and greatest on uh, 401ks, which will sort of be the theme of the program today uh, as we um, sort of start to shift into Thanksgiving mode, I guess, right? So this coming Thursday, Big Turkey Day, and then, of course, all the sales and the shopping uh, will go on after that. Although I think a lot of that actually happens before and uh, during now, because many stores are open on Thanksgiving, uh, and uh, throw that in with Cyber Monday, which I think is you know less of a distinction now. Used to be you know uh, back uh, you know five six seven years ago that your employer always had a better internet internet connection than what you could get at your house. Nowadays, that's so pervasive that you can pretty much shop anywhere, any time. Uh, but there's still an uptick on the Monday after Thanksgiving. Um, that is that Cyber Monday holiday, uh, or not holiday, uh, shopping, uh, shopping day. Uh, so on the program, we are talking about uh, a change for 401ks and for that matter, IRAs for next year. Uh, contribution limits to 401ks increase from 18,500 up to 19,000. If you're over age 50, you can also put in an extra 6 grand on top of that. Uh similarly, uh there was also an increase in your IRA contribution limit. Uh for the first time in 5 years, that contribution limit uh finally increased. Again, those contribution limits are indexed to inflation, inflation being relatively low has kept uh, the cap, if you will, on the maximum amount of the contributions that you can make to things like IRAs or Roths at 5500 for five years now. However, next year, 2019, uh, getting a little bit of a bump on that, that 5500 now increases to 6000 uh, for 2019. Uh, similarly, for um, the people that are over age 50, you can put in an extra $1,000 on top of that. So your grand total that you can fund into an IRA, $7,000 for next year. Stop and think about that. That that one has, has also, that limit has really changed over uh, over the years. When I first got in this business, it was only $2,000. So uh, that really has kind of increased, and, and rightfully so, given the trend in business and society that if it's your responsibility to fund your own retirement, it would seem to me that you probably want to have some pretty decent limits uh, uh, on what you can, in fact, fund rather than being hamstrung by a low, uh, lower limit that effectively limits how much you can put in. So, uh, both the 401k, 403b, 457 contribution limits increased for next year. Uh, similarly, the IRA uh, does as well. So that is really, uh, really some some great news for savers uh, and folks out there that want to contribute that extra money along the way. Just make sure that those contributions are properly timed. Make also sure that that's true on your IRA or your Roth. Let's say you're putting in money on a regular basis. Uh, having that go in on a monthly basis out of your check 
checking account. Well, for next year, if you want to maximize that, then you need to adjust that amount because previously, if you were observing the the maximum limit of 6500 uh, and you were doing that on a regular basis, then you would be taking 6500 and uh, putting in basically $541 and some change each and every month. Now, uh, with that uh, with that increase, uh, you're basically going to want to bump that up to $583 in order to make sure that you fully maximize out for the year. So be aware of that, that your regular investing would also need to bump up a little bit to adjust to that higher contribution limit. Similarly, um, another another thing to think about is if you are working, you obviously have different ways and different choices to make when it comes to how to save your dollars. And so one of the questions that we hear a lot about is, well, I've got a 401k uh, and I also have an option for a health savings account. Which of these two should I I I do? And and with the health savings account, that actually is one of the rare options out there that is triple tax free or, or tax deferred. It's got a triple tax benefit in that when you put the money in, it's tax deductible. It continues to grow tax deferred. And when you take it out, assuming it's for medical, it's tax free. And at 65, you can even take it out and not have to use it on medical I still might have to pay the taxes, but don't have to use it on um, on just medical stuff and still avoid the penalty. So health savings account, very valuable option uh, that you've got to contribute to, assuming that you're on a high deductible health insurance plan. And that's a plan that's offered through your uh, through your employer as your health insurance option, if you will. So the, both of them are obviously very good options. When confronted with the choice, well, we always encourage folks to do both. Uh, but um, the reality is that if you were to think of it in terms of sequence, maybe you can't do both. One of the first things that we always encourage people to do is focus on that 401k to the extent that there is a match. Okay, uh, So if your 401k has a match, That's certainly the first thing that you always want to do is at least be contributing to your 401k to get that match from your employer. Okay. After that, then it would be always good to look at that HSA, the health savings account, because uh, that amount winds up being a, a not just tax deductible, much like your retirement contributions, but it grows and it can be used tax-free for medical expenses. That, too, the limit on that, too, also increases uh, for 2019. For 2018, the maximum individual contribution was 3450 uh, For 2019, that rises up to 3500 If you're over 55, you can do a catch-up contribution of an extra thousand dollars into a health savings account. So if you're confronted with that choice, okay, I've got my 401k, I've got a health savings account. What should I do? I can't really do both. Then we encourage you to think of it in terms of a sequence, if you will. First, look at whether your 401k has uh, an employer match. If it has an employer match, then you probably want to do that first and foremost. That's free money uh, that you're not going to get anywhere else. And then once you've done that, then we would turn your attention to the HSA uh, because that's deductible and also tax-free when you take it and use it for medical expenses. And you don't lose that money. Common misconception on health savings account is everybody thinks that they're like the flex account. The flexible health spending account and the health savings account are two totally different things and have significant differences that ultimately make the health savings account a far superior option because with a flexible spending account, you've got to use that money prior to the end of the year or you lose that money. That's one of the, I think one of the reasons why not many people appreciate health savings accounts as much is because they get them confused with those flexible health spending accounts where the money disappears if you don't use it by the end of the year. In contrast, 
on a health savings account, you can carry that money forward indefinitely. So pretty significant difference between the two. If you've got your choice, 401k, HSA at work, do the 401k up to the match of the employer, but then really consider doing that health savings account uh, immediately thereafter that. Obviously, ideally, huh, you want to do both if you can. That is for sure. Uh, we'll take a break. We get back from the break. We'll kind of continue on with this conversation about 401ks. We've got some interesting stats of what the latest and greatest is on 401k balances and contribution rates as well. So some good news there, although we got some bad news on that same topic as well. So stay tuned here on Dollars and Cents. This is Joel Garris of Nelson Financial Planning on News Radio 93.1 WFLA. This is Bud Hedinger. You know, you can talk to Joel Garris of Nelson Financial Planning right now on Dollars and Cents about anything to do with your money by calling 407-916-5400. Give him a call. It's time to make sense of your dollars. Welcome back to the program, ladies and gentlemen. Dollars and Cents here on 93.1 WFLA, 540 AM uh, here uh, on... Both sides of the dial, the FM and the AM. Uh, Yaffe's my producer uh, today, and uh, so we were just talking during the break. Uh, he's got a health savings account at work uh, and uh, and enjoys it. It works out great. You were saying, how often do you get to use it? I mean, I use it all the time for my doctor's appointments or my dentist or anything. Yeah. You know, it really is great. At first, I was a little skeptical, but I really like it now. Now, you were also saying that you were getting a little, sometimes you get, con, it was confusing at first, this yeah. notion of the flexible plan versus the health savings account. Yeah, I was confused because there was an option to do like a flexible plan or something, but I have the health savings account and I don't even understand why anyone would do the other one because even with a health savings account, you get a, you get a card, like a credit card. And if you have to spend money on a doctor's appointment or whatever, you use the card just like. You know, credit card. Yeah, super convenient. Yeah, oftentimes people find that the, the they do the flexible plan if they don't have the health savings account option of, available because you can have one but not the, but not the other. But but yeah, to to our listeners out there, if you've got that health savings account option, um, you, you really focus on that health savings account much more uh, than the flex spending account. Um, my wife at work does not have a health savings account option. So she has a flex plan. And then every year we have to make sure that we, that we use it. That's a significant limitation of the flex plan, but don't let that thought limit you when it comes to looking at that health savings account, make sure you're getting the right one and understand the difference between the two. That's for, that's for sure. So that's cool. Clear channel's got uh, health savings accounts. That's or no, no, it's not clear channel. I heart media. I heart media. Yes. Used to be clear. channel. I got to get it right. Okay. Yes. Um, I heart media health savings are good for them. Good stuff. Indeed. Uh, do they have a 401k? Uh, yes, they do. Uh, very good. Do they match? Uh, yes, they do. I'm not sure what percentage yet I've been, I'm going to start my 401k next year. Okay. So I've been bugged enough good to do man. that. Come on, Yaffe. <laughs> let's go. Uh, you got to make that at least do up to their match. Cause that's their money. You might as well take it. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, in- indeed. Indeed. So, so yeah, the good, the other good news on four hundred one k is is that uh, contribution rates uh, are at their highest level uh, since two thousand six. So, um, so that is very good news on four hundred one k's to see that contribution rate at up to eight point seven percent. Although, when you stop and think about it, um, you know that that is um, probably not as 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 high as it as it should be for folks that are basically on their own for saving for retirement. But the overall average employee 401k contribution uh, up to 8.7%, uh, the highest level since 2006, that really is uh, some pretty good, uh, good news across the, uh, across the board. Uh, also, uh, you saw um, a record high, uh, as of the end of the third quarter of 2018, obviously that's September 30th, been a lot, a lot of market volatility. 
this week, again, that volatility continued uh, in the overall markets uh, as we sort of get through earnings season uh, and look ahead to 2019. There continues to be concern of, of, of the economy not growing as fast as it was. And then the backdrop of that is uh, this expectation that the Federal Reserve uh, is going to continue to raise interest rates. I think at the end of the day, the Federal Reserve is going to have to look at the economic data out there and perhaps pull back on the the frequency of their interest rate increases. We are incredibly far in front of the rest of the world in terms of interest rate uh, as it exists today. Our, we're at 3% on our you know, U.S. government bond. Germany is only at a half a percent. The Bank of Japan uh, is only at 0.1. So we're, we're way out in front in terms of the interest rates. Uh, and at the end of the day, uh, hopefully uh, the Federal Reserve, and there's been, there was some comments this, just this past week uh, of the Federal Reserve sort of acknowledging and saying, hey, wait a minute, maybe we will, um, you know, uh, perhaps uh, recognize that the economic data has sort of shifted a bit over the course of the past uh, couple of months. And I think if you can get a signal from the Federal Reserve that they're not going to raise interest rates as much or as quickly as they as they previously were expected, I think uh, that that would go a long ways towards helping to you know cure down the volatility. But but the the data as of the end of the third quarter, uh, the highest balance of the highest average balance of 401k, 403b, and IRA accounts, a record high uh, September 30, 2018. So that's all the that's all great news. Record balances, uh, that's good. More people need to be much more aware of how much they need to be putting into their retirement to help fund uh, their retirement because your employer is not going to do it. Here's the bad news, or here's, here's kind of the... the you know, the mm, I wish that wasn't the case. Half of all 401k accounts, half of all 401k accounts now hold 100 percent of their savings in a target date fund. Half own 100 percent in a target date fund. The reason I don't like that and you've heard us talk about it on the program before, is that target date funds have a tendency to be much more conservative than you realize. And they get there much, much faster in terms of that conservative balance much earlier than you think. It's almost like these target date funds were created so that if, on the date of your projected retirement, the assets are effectively not invested. The the problem with that, of course, is that if you're retiring at 65 uh, and you are a married couple, the odds are nearly 100% that one of you will see 85. So that's a 20-year time horizon. A 20-year time horizon and you're going to enter that long of a time period with an asset allocation that basically has no opportunity or no option for growth over time. That doesn't work. And that's the single biggest limitation with these target date funds is they have a tendency to be very conservative very early, and that's not going to work for you to have a successful retirement. They also have a tendency to be very different from one provider to the next. Company A's target date 2030 fund versus company B's target date 2030 fund may have up to a 10 or 20 percent difference in terms of the mix of stocks versus bonds. So if you've got one target date, fund of the same year that's 80-20 and another one that's 60-40, that's a pretty big difference in terms of the asset allocation. It's those kinds of things that you want to just, I mean, I understand 
I understand the notion of target date funds. It's meant to simplify investing for individuals. But folks, let's face it, sometimes hitting the easy button, taking the simplest route is not the best way to do anything. It's not. And it certainly doesn't work with your finances. So make sure that if you are using one of those target date funds, that you have a firm understanding of what the mix is, stocks versus bonds, and also appreciate that the target date fund is basically geared to have a minimal amount of growth strategy or growth option on that particular target date. I like to describe that in the office as that's not your date of death on your target date fund. That's your date of retirement. And there's a big difference between the two. We'll continue the conversation here on 401ks uh, here on dollars and cents. This is Joel Garris of Nelson Financial Planning. We will be back right after these messages. This is Bud Hedinger. You know, you can talk to Joel Garris of Nelson Financial Planning right now on Dollars and Cents about anything to do with your money by calling 407-916-5400. Give him a call. It's time to make sense of your dollars. Welcome back to the program, ladies and gentlemen. Dollars and Cents here on News Radio 93.1 WFLA. Uh, Also simulcasting over there on the AM dial at 540 AM. Um, we are talking on the program today uh, a bit about 401ks and retirement plans and those kinds of options. I guess it is that time of year when folks are sort of in their open enrollment periods, trying to pick, trying to choose, trying to, trying to make decisions. Uh, the good news is that uh, the limits for how much you can contribute to 401ks, 403bs, 457s are in fact going up. For the first time in many years next year, the total limit, 19000 If you're over age 50, you can put in an extra six grand, so that gets you all the way up to 25000 Also, though, on that same front, your IRA and Roth contribution limits also went up by $500 uh, so that you are able to contribute up to $6,000 uh, uh, to any IRA or Roth. If you're over 50, you can add another 1000 to that, making the total contribution limit to be 7000 So that's a pretty good chunk now that you can get into those IRAs and uh, Roths. Make sure that you are adjusting your regular investing, whether it be through your paycheck or whether it be out of your checking account, to make sure that you are uh, putting in that maximum number to try and hit that maximum no- number. And other good news on 401k fronts, record uh, average employee contribution rates. That is great news. More and more people starting to do 401ks. Uh, That contribution uh, rate uh, reached an 8.7%, which is the highest level in 2006. So that is good news. Of course, the bad news on that is why is that the highest level since 2006? You mean to tell me, okay, that over the course of the past 12 years, people have been putting less into their 401ks than they were 12 years ago? I I guess that sort of is what that means, isn't it? Well, that's pretty unfortunate. Uh, I wonder if there was perhaps an overreaction to the negative market performance in 2008. If anything, that should have been the time to ramp up your contributions, not ramp them down. I fear, however, though, that most people ramped them down in reaction to the market when they should have done exactly the opposite of that, ramping them up. They would have been investing and purchasing more shares when the market was down. But sadly, that probably didn't happen. Um, the other development that has happened over the course of the past 10 years is the proliferation of target date funds. Now, half of all 401k accounts have 100% of their accounts in a target date fund. I've got a little bit of a problem with that because I don't think target date funds 
are as good as they are marketed to be. They are meant to be an easy, simple solution. But sometimes easy and simple is not the way to go. Because anything easy and simple is going to be designed, particularly because it's being designed by the financial services industry, it's being designed in the most conservative manner possible. And the problem is that those funds typically have a much higher portion on the bond side and the cash side than most folks realize. And in fact, the allocation of that stock versus bonds and cash can vary widely on a same titled fund among different mutual fund companies. Those are the things that really concern us as it relates to those target date funds. You've now got half solely using those funds. Folks, you've got to peel back the layers of the onion on that and make sure that you wind up looking at the underlying allocation stocks versus bonds of that fund because that ultimately is going to determine how good you do over time with that fund. Uh, in other 401k news, this is a this is a new one, but, uh, but I suspect we may be hearing more about that. Uh, this is a program uh, or a version of the of a 401k that was introduced uh, by by Abbott uh, to its employees, and they actually uh, submitted it to the Internal Revenue Service uh, to be reviewed. Um, and in fact, uh, the IRS actually a- approved it. So it's a very unique 401k plan structure that addresses uh, what has been sort of the, the, the biggest issue, if you will, um, for uh, new employees to the workforce, for that younger generation. Uh, and that is uh, the fact that they all have a tremendous amount of, of student debt, student loans, major factor, particularly if you're under the age of 40. So there are some employees, well, employers, uh, particularly uh, the folks at Abbott, uh, that have developed a, a sort of a new 401k to help people address that. And, and so this is kind of fascinating, um, you know, when you start to kind of look through how they did it and how they set it up. Um, and the fact that the Internal Revenue Service approved it means that we're probably going to see and hear much more of 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 this. But student loan debt, uh, as you've as you've heard the numbers before on the program, now in excess of credit card debt, probably uh, the single biggest issue facing that generation under forty, the millennial generation. Uh, because uh, they're the ones that you know went to school and spent a lot of time in school. And all the while, school costs were uh, going up at at just in my view unexplainable increases at, at the end of the day. Okay, because the last I talked to uh, anybody that actually taught at a college, their salary certainly wasn't going up by those types of the, the cost to print a book certainly wasn't going up. I mean, I just. I, but the buildings on campus, those were going up left and right. I really question uh, that increase of cost over time. Of course, questioning even more as I'm about ready to send my firstborn off to college next year. Uh, what exactly is that going for? Anyway, I digress. Clearly a significant issue for, um, for that generation. Uh, and now we've, we've got a, a 401k. Uh, that plan uh, that that sort of starts to to address that that has in fact been approved by the IRS. So here's how it works. Okay, it was a program, pilot program introduced um, by, uh, by by Abbott, uh, whereby if you contribute five uh, percent, or if you contribute, if, if you are directing at least two percent, two percent of your pay towards paying down your student loans, 2% of your pay towards paying down your student loans, the company, the employer, would contribute 5% of your pay to a tax-deferred 401k plan. Let me me work that one through one last time. 
because it's really pretty powerful. It's an incentive to encourage people to help pay down their debt while at the same time helping to boost up their retirement savings. So let me explain it, how it works one more time. So the deal with, with that, that this company came up with is if you work for us and if you have student loans and if you direct at least 2% of your pay towards paying down those student loans, so it's got to come out of your paycheck, go directly to pay off student loans, then we, the employer, in essence, condition our match – or condition our contribution to your retirement based upon you trying to pay off your student loans. And in fact, they were contributing 5% of pay for those that it, that had at least 2% of their pay going towards paying down their student loans. So just a fascinating, um, a, a, a fascinating sort of twist, I guess, or a new development on the 401k level that really helps to try and address these other issues that are out there. Uh, you know, average typical graduate of college leaves to school with about $40,000 of debt. There's over 2.5 million Americans that have debt loads, college debt loads in excess of 100000 a record $1.5 trillion in student loan debt. Uh, a fascinating variation of a 401k that was approved by the IRS. I think we're going to hear more and more about that uh, because that's clearly an issue that needs to be uh, tackled. Uh, those are the kinds of things that we certainly talk about and share about here on the, the program. Uh, we hope you enjoyed a little bit more of a 401k type based program this morning with some of the uh, up to date numbers and changes and contribution levels uh, on it. Uh, we're going to get out of here because, uh, you know, Thanksgiving's coming up. So we got to get organized for that. Hope you all have a great Thanksgiving. Much to be thankful for living in the greatest country in the planet here on Dollars and Cents. This is Joel Garris, Nelson Financial Planning, News Radio 93.1 WFLA. This is Bud Hedinger, and you've been listening to Dollars and Cents with Joel Garris of Nelson Financial Planning. If you missed any part of today's show or want to listen to it again, check out the radio show at www.nelsonfinancialplanning.com or connect with them on Facebook or Twitter. Be sure to call Joel this week at 407-629-6477 to schedule your free consultation to discuss your retirement plan.